Thank you. That is so exciting. I was, I'm buzzing now. Congrats, Ryan and Erin. I didn't know that. Very good. Um, well, a few, a few people probably did. Their families might have known, so that's okay. Um, we did, uh, we did thank, you, thank you, Tim, for your meeting leading this morning. And uh, today I did want to just mention, because we mentioned it in the 8.30 as well, that we do have a partic- did have a particular focus on the Sri Lankan kids' homes and how um, our mission giving goes towards that. So, guys, do you want to just put up a couple of the pictures of that? That would be awesome. Just the Bethel Kids Homes that we actually support as part of our mission giving. Uh, there's 20 boys in one home and 20 girls in the other home, which is fantastic. And they've also purchased a farm with, where um, CRC Sri Lanka grows a lot of the food to support those homes. They've also started a sewing school. And so our mission giving goes towards that. And the sewing school, they're hoping to skill some of the young women. So when they graduate from the orphanage or from the, the home, that they can actually have skills to go into their community and actually uh, make a difference, earn an income, all those sorts of things. So it's some powerful work that's taking place in the nation of Sri Lanka. And CRC Churches is the denominational family that we belong to, our church is part of. So thank you, church, for your giving. Just wanted to show you some of those pictures. But if you want more info, you can see uh, myself or Pastor Bruce Hamble. Cool. Well, good old Billy Graham, hey? What a legend. Have you been reading and following all the different social media and articles and tweets I have and uh, I was just thinking about what a champion he he was and is because uh, he is still alive and in God's presence uh, right now (laughs) not alive on this earth but he's actually alive with Jesus and I just wanted to read you a quote that I um, that I saw the other day which was actually something that he said about Uh, when he passed away. A lot of people have actually quoted it. You might have seen them. Um, And it just talks about the reality of heaven. And it's such a powerful quote. Just give me one second. (coughs) It may not be working. Basically, he just says, you know, one day you're going to hear and you're going to read that Billy Graham's passed away. But don't don't be fool, don't be upset because I've actually just changed a dress. I'm very much alive and in the presence of God. And I saw, so, so many people have been quoting it. And it's such a powerful quote about the reality of heaven and, and the fact that he was someone who was steadfast in his commitment to understanding that people's eternities hang in the balance. You know, he was a steadfast in his witness for Jesus and in someone who. I was just thinking about how much he equipped even the local church, like the Billy Graham organisation. He was preaching the gospel and evangelists, having all these rallies, but often months and years before they went into a town that they would get together the leaders of the church and then equip people and how to pray, how to follow up new believers, how to connect them into the local church. And so, yeah, what a champion, what a hero. And uh, it just reminds us, just like he understood that heaven is real, that people's eternal destinations hang in the balance, that the church really is the message that we've got and who we are. We really are the hope of the world. And that's what this whole series has been about, about being the church that we can be, the church that Jesus has a vision for, the church that Jesus shed his blood to purchase so that God could have a people for himself upon the earth, the church that can enfold and welcome new people into his family. It's this beautiful reality that Jesus has made possible. And with the Holy Spirit's help, it's the church we can, we really can be. And so God calls us to keep on growing up into this reality of being the church we can be. And this is the final week of our series. Uh, And the scripture we're looking at this morning is Ephesians 4. Uh, verses 12 through to 16, the second part of verse 12. So we're going to read that together. Not the whole verse won't be up on your screen, but then we're going to unpack. Oh, they have. Legends. Or maybe that's just the first bit. That's all right. All right. Ephesians 4. It starts just a bit before says that so that the purpose of God equipping or giving gifts to his people so that they can equip his church for works of service. So pastors, prophets, evangelists, teachers talks all about that equipping the church so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith 
and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we would no longer be like infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its special work. I want to start by just helping us think about something that we are, we, not a building, we are part of the church we can be. If, we're, if you're a follower of Jesus here today uh, and if you're our guest, you're welcome to be here and check out what Christian faith means. But if you're a follower of Jesus here today, we collectively a part of his universal church, but we're also part of this local church. But just as that's true, sometimes it can be easy to say, well, we, oh yeah, we, we're the church, awesome. It can be hard sometimes to apply that to I. What does that mean for my involvement and my participation and my contribution to the collective body? So I want to talk about some things and help, you, help us to focus on some things that come out of this scripture uh, that we just read that help us to see that to be the church we can be, like Pastor Tim said in week, I think, three, I need to take some personal responsibility. There's we, but the we is made up of lots of little individual parts, right? So it has application for me personally, what I need to do. So the first thing I wanted us to think about is to be the church we can be. I can't stay how I am now. Might seem really obvious, but to be the church we can be. I, you, can't stay how we are right now. To become an adult, a child cannot stay as a child, right? As much as they want to, they never want to, I don't want to grow up. <laughs> I'm going to live with mum and dad forever. So my kids say to me. Now they've planned at three levels. Callan lives on the top, Angus in the middle, and mum and dad on the bottom. Like, just talk to your wives about that later. They might not be happy with that. <laughs> but think of the developmental growth of infants into toddlers and then into preschoolers, and then into primary schoolers, and then into pre-teens and teens and adults, mature adults, and then those who are spiritual and biological parents. Think about the growth and the developmental change that happens. We don't necessarily like growth because growth requires change and stretching and pruning and letting go of old ways of doing things to embrace something far better. It's uncomfortable, <laughs> it's inconvenient, it's messy and we can't control it. Probably why we don't like it. <laughs> we don't love change, we can't fully see the benefits of growth and change when it's happening but in hindsight we can look back and go, do you know what, that was really good for me. But we can't see it when we're right in the midst of it sometimes. Lasting change requires the right environment and the right ingredients and it usually takes time. Anything of worth, lasting worth, usually. There's a great book by Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend called How People Grow. It's a fantastic book. Um, and he talks about this formula which is what basically what the Bible teaches, which is that to grow, grace plus truth plus time is what's needed. Grace plus truth applied over time equals growth. And I want you to keep that in mind as you read and just focus on the next little part of that uh, passage in Ephesians. It says, 
In Ephesians 4, 12, just the first little bit, 12b to the first part of 13, it says, So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. For all of us to reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son means that each one of us has to grow. We can't stay how we are now. Because are you perfect? I sure ain't. To grow, we need to have a clearer picture of Jesus as he really is, an ever-increasing clearer picture of Jesus as he really is. We need to have exposure to the truth. Pastor Bill in his book, The Church We Can Be, says it's absolutely crucial to be growing in our understanding about Christ and his teachings as recorded in the four Gospels. Each person must be presented with a clear picture of God's Son as recorded in the Bible. We can't divorce Jesus from what we believe and how we should live. His words and the apostles' application of his teachings in the New Testament writings can be difficult to understand, hard to follow, incredibly inconvenient and even unpopular. However, if we really believe that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life as God's Son... We must align ourselves to him. This is the essence of Christian discipleship. Jesus is Lord. We sang about it this morning. And we are to submit to his governance for our lives. We cannot invent a Jesus of our own making who's going to tell us everything what we want to hear because he's not going to tell, everything, tell us everything we want to hear. <laughs> he's going to tell us things that help us grow. And help us become more like him. (laughs) Because he is God and we are not. He is truth. And so who he is and what he says is ultimate reality. Unless you remain and come back to and return again and are devoted to Jesus and his words, there can be no lasting growth or real kingdom fruit in your life. For you to be the man or woman he's called you to be, you must remain or start (laughs) being steadfastly devoted to Jesus and his words. To be the church we can be, we must steadfastly be devoted to Jesus and his words. And so we need an ever clearer picture, not of our own making, but of who Jesus really is. And we can only find that as we read him about him and the Holy Spirit shows us what he's like in the Bible that's the truth he is the truth (laughs) remember we need truth to grow we also need a continual experience of real relationship with Jesus a relationship that we don't initiate that we don't deserve but that God has given us opportunity to have as a free gift because of what Jesus has done. Again, in his book, The Church We Can Be, Pastor Book writes, the end game is for all Jesus followers to be encountering Jesus and experiencing more of him in their day-to-day lives. As you get to know him, you can't help but want to experience and know him more. The more you encounter Jesus personally, the more you want to willingly yield control of your life over to him because he's breathtakingly amazing. (laughs) He's so good. He's so gentle. He's so faithful. He's so kind. He's so powerful. And if you don't know him today, if you don't have a personal relationship with him, if you've come along to church and it's like going through the motions, but you don't know Jesus, you don't have a relationship, a heart knowledge of him, you can today. He died on the cross. His blood was shed. The weight of sin went on him who didn't deserve it, not on you and me. His blood hands and feet were nailed and his blood was shed not for his own sin but for yours 
and for mine and for the things that separate us from God. And he didn't just stay dead. We read about it in our Life Journal today. It says that Paul insisted that Jesus is alive. He's alive. We worship a risen Saviour and he can come into the life of any person who says, you know what, I can't get to God on my own. I can't make myself right with God. I want to know God as my Heavenly Father, but I need someone who's made a way for me. And Jesus has made that way. And you can know him today. You can start a relationship with him and it will change your life. It's what you were made for. You weren't made to just go through the mundane nine to five thing. You were made for God. You're made for eternity. He set eternity in our hearts. You're made to be fully alive to God and to walk in his ways and his purposes. Jesus has made it possible. And so we need to be continually exposed to this grace of what he's done for us. How does we revert back into trying to impress him or trying to think we have to please him to get him to like us? When he already loves us, he already likes us because of Jesus. <laughs> he already accepts us right now as we are. He accepts us and welcomes us, but he, but he says, you know what? I want to make you into the best you that you could ever be. And that can only happen as my power comes on the inside and helps you. We need grace plus truth applied over time because it changes us and it grows us to be more mature. We need to be continually growing by having this clearer picture of Jesus as he really is. We need a continual experience of real relationship with him because it involves a lifetime. Billy Graham proved that, a lifetime of growing more like Jesus. (laughs) You notice in that Ephesians 4 verse 13 verse, it says, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Attaining means destination, arriving at a destination. This side of eternity, while I still have breath in my body, I will never arrive at the whole measure of the fullness of Christ because he is so awesome. He's so amazing. And if you're bored by him, you don't, I would say, get to know him. (laughs) Ask him to show you who he really is because he is amazing. He's not boring. But this is our goal, Christ's likeness to increasingly become more like Christ. Notice that it's not just one. It's not just truth and it's not just grace and it's not just time that causes growth, but all three. I know Christians who seem so loving, but sadly, in their pursuit of being loving, they've let go of truth. They've violated their conscience, gone against what the Bible teaches, and refused to stand for what is right in God's sight. I know Christians who wield truth like a hammer. There's no concern or love for precious people. They violate the biblical principles of love to impart their own self-righteous agenda packaged as the truth. Jesus never did this. I know Christians who think they are mature because they've been in the faith a long time, but really they're spiritual infants. The Bible teaches us the longer we've walked with Jesus, the more we should think and behave and act like him. And the room's gone really quiet. Just like... I've been really challenged this week. (laughs) Don't you worry. Do you know, I was talking with my son about some of the tennis players that you see on TV who get quite, shall we say, upset (laughs) if they don't get their own way. And I thought, what a great object lesson. I said, do you know, the reason why I teach you about handling your emotions in a healthy way and learning how to express what you want in a way that's respectful towards others is because I don't want you to end up to be a child in an adult's body who is having a tanty, a massive tantrum spit because they're not getting their own way. When we see it in other people, it's so ugly. We don't see it in ourselves. (laughs) To be the church we can be, I can't stay how I am now. 
and neither can you. If you and I, as individual members of Christ's body, refuse to grow, do you know, it has an impact on the we. (laughs) It actually stunts our collective potential as the church we can be. And I think that breaks God's heart. There's so many times when God has challenged me about laying down an attitude I didn't want to lay down. Forgiving someone I didn't want to forgive. Being faithful in the small things when I didn't want to do it. Rocking up when I felt too tired. And I'm not saying he doesn't stop because he's continually just talking to me about aspects of my character, the what I speak the attitudes and the thoughts of my heart because he wants me to grow. And in that loving, trusting relationship where I know Jesus loves me and he'll never leave me or forsake me, it's a safe place to actually say to him, you know what, I struggle, I don't do this well because he'll never reject us even when we say that. He'll say, you know what, I'm here to help, not to point the finger. I'm going to pour in my power and strength Instead of you relying on your own strength, you're going to have my power at work in your life. To be the church we can be, I can't stay how I am now, but also I can't settle for fake spirituality. So easily we drift towards putting our own desires and our own pleasures above God's desires and what will bring him pleasure. We settle for fake imitations. One of the most challenging passages of Scripture is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. And we're going to read this together. He says to Timothy, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Now, the last days he's talking about is the times between Jesus going to be with the Father and him coming back again. We're living in the last days. We don't know when Jesus is coming back, but he's coming back. Could be tomorrow. Just saying, could be. So as we read through this list from 2 Timothy 3, we never put ourselves in it. We think Paul is talking about people who have given themselves over to darkness and evil and really want to harm the church. People outside the church who are just no awareness of God. That's what we think. But Paul pops in verse number five. (laughs) He says these people hold to a form of godliness denying its power. He's actually talking about those within the church. He's describing professing Christians. And if we're engaging in some of those behaviours as Christ followers, he's describing us. Now that's one that will hit you in the guts. (laughs) He's describing a fake imitation of living that does not work, walk worthy of this beautiful reality that Jesus has won for us. He's talking about people whose religion is just an empty shell. And the message is even more brutal. <laughs> it says in verse 5, they'll make a show of religion, but behind the scenes, they're animals. Walzer. He's talking about people who lack the reality of a genuine walk with Jesus. People who look good on the outside. They talk a good line. They put on a good front. But in their motives, their thought lives and their relationships, they're not growing in godliness. And it's easy to read verse 1 to 4 and dismiss it as not being relevant to us. But Paul included verse 5 for a reason. He said, You can't just put on a show and have outward performance where you don't invite Christ into areas of your life and think that that's going to cause godly growth. There's no power in that. You can't change yourself. 
I believe he wanted Timothy and us to do some personal soul searching. And trust me, I've been doing a little bit this week preparing for this message. But he wants us to ask, Lord, is that me? Could I be drifting into holding to a form of godliness, but denying you access into an area in my life and therefore denying the very power that can transform my heart and help me be more like Jesus? If you have the inward reality of a relationship with the Lord, you will be growing in assessing your life each day through the filter of the Bible. Out of gratitude to all he's done for you, you'll be increasingly confessing and forsaking evil thoughts and selfish motivations because you want to bring God pleasure. I'm not talking about perfection, but I'm talking about an increase in desire with these things. You will be consistently wanting to talk to him about areas where you need his power to grow you more like Christ. You'll be learning to thank him that he accepts you just as you are and is pleased with you because of Jesus, but regularly acknowledging you need his help (laughs) to live out his words. You'll be more frequently examining your life and the characteristics Paul talks about in in 2 Timothy 3. And with Jesus' help, turn from them into thought, word and deed. How about this for a bit of a spiritual checkup? Those who are closest to us should be able to, to observe the reality of the Lordship of Jesus in our daily life. Do they? I want to talk about Pastor Bill and Kathy. I can because they're not here. (laughs) I believe they've been catalysts for the presence and the power of God for over 40 years because they're always allowing Jesus to transform them and to be more like him. Like on their own admission, they're not perfect. They're very real about (laughs) areas where they're still growing. But they're dependent on Jesus. I see the reality of Jesus' lordship in their everyday life. Do you? It costs them to follow Jesus and serve his purposes. It costs them time, energy, money, being inconvenienced, doing things they don't always want to do, but persistently following him. Serving when they don't feel like serving, giving sacrificially, taking time to be interrupted by God, to walk alongside others, relying on his wisdom, receiving God's nourishing and provision and strengthening help each step of the way. Mature in the faith, but always growing. We can follow their example as they follow Christ. To be the church, we can be, I can't settle for fake spirituality and neither can you. Because the church is God's people and as his family, when you and I settle and allow fake spirituality to go unaddressed, it hardens our heart to the presence and the power of God. It actually grieves the Holy Spirit. God cannot anoint what he has not endorsed and God does not endorse sinful behaviour and attitudes. Persisting in sinful patterns of behaviours and attitudes that go against his word when our Heavenly Father has lovingly shown us an area we need to hand over to him. If we persist in it, it actually blocks his presence and power from flowing through us. We cannot grow and move forward until we lay it down Or turn away from it as Jesus is asking us to. Until we pick up and turn towards what he says is good and right and honouring to him in his word. And if we willfully and stubbornly persist in fake spirituality while claiming to follow Christ, we will attract a type of anointing that is most definitely not from God. A destructive and demonic anointing from hell. And you see that in the book of Acts. People who claimed to be the most religious had this self-righteousness that was not godly. And that's why the scripture implore us again and again. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. But the good news (laughs) is that the Holy Spirit's always at work to help us to hear Jesus' words, to pay attention to the heart drift and to say, Lord, I need your help. To give us the desire to repent or change our mind and then the power to actually respond to his voice 
as we bend our will to his will and as we bow our knee to his lordship. And so I'm very conscious that he's speaking to us today. I want to live a life, a fragrant life that smells of authentic love for Jesus. Do you? Yeah. He knows that we do. We need his help to do it. (laughs) To be the church we can be, I can't settle for fake spirituality and neither can you. To be the church we can bear, I need to grow up into Christ. Ephesians 4 goes on in verse 14. It says, then we will no longer be immature like children. The NIV says like infants. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Do you know what infants, I was thinking about infants. Infants are solely reliant on others and on, on communicating what they need. For survival. They're babies. They lack the capacity to feed or look after themselves. They're unable to help others. They're unable to work out and discern if something is good for them or not. That's why Paul says we need to grow up into Christ and no longer cling to being infants in the faith. As we grow up in understanding his word, we're not fooled by Deceptive heresies and error, which is always exaggerated truth. (laughs) So I want you to think about this morning, who are you listening to on podcasts? What books are you reading? Do the speakers and the authors have a proven track record of selfless service, integrity of character? Are they transparent and accountable for their own conduct? Is what they're teaching Christ-honouring and faithful? to what Jesus says and how the apostles apply it. It's so easy to be able to, Tim and I were talking about this, it's so easy to be able to flick off a computer screen or change the channel when we don't like what we hear. That's why coming to church, sitting under the ministry of his word, we can't actually control that in one sense. <laughs> can leave whenever we want to, but we can't actually turn it off when we don't like something. Do you need to enrol in a credible Bible course or get some advice from any of our CFC pastors about a good commentary to help you unpack and understand the scripture? Do you, know, do you need to learn how to be a self-feeder of God's word? So during the week, you can look it up and you go, can find things and understand and apply the Bible, the big themes of the Bible. Do you need to be trained in how to correctly handle the word of God? So you're not tricked and fooled and think that something's biblical when it might not be. I recommend as a great starting point two books. They're both by Dr. Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. One is called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. The other one is called How to Read the Bible Book by Book. You can get them on Kindle. You can get them from Amazon. Uh, Amazon Kindle or Kurong, sorry, I should say. How to read the Bible for all it's worth. How to read the Bible book by book. If you want more information about that, come and see me after. Are you mostly thinking about your week, your schedule, your time, yourself? If you're a Christ follower, the Bible says think of others more highly than yourself. Don't think only of your own interests. Do you need encouragement? You know what the best thing I've found? Go and encourage someone. Seriously. (laughs) Do you need help with something? Think about how you can help someone else. Do you feel lonely and need friendship? Be the best friend that you can be to someone. Do you lack meaning and purpose and a sense of fulfillment? Go and do good to someone who can never repay you. They can't repay you back. Just do good to them. Right now, we have some specific needs, areas of opportunities to serve in our church family. We have a CFC South that is launching. We have so many opportunities and ways for us to roll up our sleeves and collectively we (laughs) play our part with the gifts that God's given us. Like Pastor Bill said last week, 
We're relaunching our Sunday night service. We need 12 more people to fill the teams for Sunday nights. We need two baristas, people who can make good coffee. Maybe it's not going to be a long-term thing, but maybe you can invest in launching and getting it off the ground. We want to start some family connect groups. So parents with young kids can actually come and have a meal together with the kids and the family and then and we'll help you think about ways of how do you actually manage kids in that environment? What do we do? <laughs> we need new connect group leaders. Our kids' ministry, Sunday AM, we need preschool, primary school and Friday night breakout team members. We're not just going to let whoever applies join kids' ministry because it's very specific and we actually have to do police checks and all that sort of stuff. But if you are sitting on a passion or could help in those ways, come and see me. CFC South, my goodness, so many opportunities. What is God saying? Maybe for a time he's calling you to invest your gifts into getting a new church off the ground. Some of you feel stuck today, but honestly, you don't have to stay there. (laughs) God's word is not chained and his word is life-giving. Start to engage with the Bible again. Open it up and ask Jesus to speak to you. That's a dangerous prayer to pray because he'll honour it and he'll do it. Commit to learning and deepening your knowledge of scripture Ask God, how do you want me to play my part in this church? I'm part of this church. This is my family. How do you want me to contribute? We have to grow up in Christ. And we never arrive at that. And lastly, to be the church we can be, I must understand what's at stake. I must understand what's at stake. Paul uses three images to describe Jesus' church as a bride, a body, and an army. What happens when these are not healthy and growing? Well, think of a marriage when there's no intimacy. It's like a legal union. There's no fire, there's no passion, there's no intimacy, there's no closeness. Think of that picture when you think, that's not a healthy picture of Jesus' church. We're meant to delight in and worship and adore our saviour a body when it's not healthy healthy can atrophy there can be imbalanced growth can be ineffective and directionless can be an overuse or reliance on some parts of the body it's like the body's trying to run but it's limping where do you need to take your place and run your race in this church What about an army? You can have numbers, you can have masses of soldiers, but if they have no unity, no sense of commander leading them, no sense of being under the authority of the commander, no sense of outworking their mission, there's no momentum. It's like they're impotent with no power. To not be the church we can be is not very attractive to a watching world. It's like, The bride picture, people don't want boring religion but no passionate relationship. Why would they want to come to to a church where they think, oh, yeah, that's good, they're just going through the motions, but there's not really any heart in it? People don't want a human institution of infighting, power grabbing, politics, and division with some social good to offer society. And if they see that that's all the church is, instead of a body, a loving, unified, diverse body that is working together, everyone placed where Jesus wants, everyone being strengthened where Jesus wants, everyone coming together and using their gifts, that is powerful. They don't want to see an irrelevant, out of touch, impotent church. God's called us to be a spiritually empowered army, forcefully advancing to see people rescued out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. Do we believe this, church? What is at stake? Our witness to a resurrected Christ, that is so at stake. (laughs) Who he is and all he's done. What is at stake? People's eternal futures. And what is at stake? The glory of God. The glory of God. 
I can't stay as I am now. I can't settle for fake spirituality. I can't not and refuse to choose to grow up in Christ. I can't ignore what's at stake. And then Paul says a fantastic word. He says, instead. I love it that he puts that in this passage. It's like he's painting a vision for us how to come back, how to stay true, how to hold fast to this beautiful reality that Jesus sees and has won and who we are in him. He says, instead, we will speak the truth in love. In the John Stop commentary, that speaking the truth in love is not the best rendition of the word. It, it literally means truthing in love, maintaining, living, and doing the truth in love. Instead, we will maintain, live, and do the truth in love, growing up in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I love it that it's instead we will. Do you know what this is? This is a declaration, not of independence, but a declaration of dependence. A declaration of dependence on Jesus. We will maintain, live and do the truth what Jesus says and does and the way he does it in love. We will grow up in every way more like Christ. We will rely on Jesus, the head of the body, the church. We will allow him to mould us and make us fit together as we yield to his leadership. We will draw on his unlimited resources as our source and our supply. We will discover, discern and deploy the gifts he's given us so we can serve and do our individual special work as part of this collective body. We will help the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. It's a declaration of dependence. I love it. He's not trying to make it happen in his own strength. He's saying, you know what? We don't want to be like that. We're not very infants. We want to be who God's made us to be, the church we can be. I really felt God, as I'm preparing this sermon, give me something to speak over (laughs) and encourage us with this morning. I'm going to read it out now. If you will each lay hold of this word today and you will commit in your hearts to being the church you can be, by each committing yourself to me, Jesus, and to letting him, me, grow you personally, your collective story will not be one of boring religion, infighting, power-grabbing or division, It's not a human concept or a human-driven organisation happening here. You won't be irrelevant, be out of touch or impotent and ineffective in my kingdom. Instead, instead, Christian Family Centre Seton, Christian Family Centre South, instead, (laughs) you will be pulsating with my resurrection life. You will radiate my love, life and power to a world that desperately needs to know I love them. I want a relationship with every man, woman and child I made for myself. You will have forward momentum and unity and work together like never before with great joy, representing me and doing my will and work and declaring my praises. You will rise and plunder the kingdom of darkness, shoulder to shoulder like a mighty army, strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy and to tread on snakes and scorpions. Nothing will harm you. I will work with you and confirm my word through a demonstration of my power, bringing glory to my name. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon CFC churches because the Lord has anointed you to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent you to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Can you say amen to that? We are making a declaration of dependence this morning. Let's stand to our feet.